George Galloway and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. He may never get to heaven. He may be the SH1T that many of you think he is. He may do nothing ever again in his life. But what Elon Musk did this week is of world historic importance. And you haven't even begun to hear the end of it. And a convoy of death passed, overtaken by yours truly on the M6 heading north this very afternoon. Finally, there is incontrovertible truth that the American presidential election was stolen. Not the one in 2016, the one in 2020, and not by the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians or the Venezuelans or the North Koreans, but by Twitter. And it is a scandal of the ages. Speaking of the Chinese, Neutral Ireland has decided to cut off its nose to make it look more like NATO. It's begun the moves to outlaw Huawei on the Emerald Isle. All this and very, very much more coming up over the next two hours on the mother of all talk shows, the Open University of the Airwaves, the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees and where you are encouraged to speak back to the teacher. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night, as Betty Davis once said. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Unless you're on Twitter or are one of the alumni of this open university of the airwaves, you don't even know that the Twitter file scandal has broken. But you will, that I promise you. Some cynics say nothing will ever come of it because to a man and woman and indeterminate gender, every one of the liberal media elite is caught red-handed in the scandal and therefore will not breathe a word about it. But the Supreme Court of the United States may take a different view. That's the Supreme Court of the United States that we were told was stuffed full of Donald Trump's appointees. What am I talking about if you are just tuning in to this story? Elon Musk paid $44 billion for a $10 billion company called Twitter, on which I have spent a good deal of my time over the last couple of decades nearly. It's worth my while, or at least it was. I had built up a 400,000 following on Twitter with a mixture of sagacity and humor and a bit of personal news about my boys banging in the goals every weekend. And then the previous ownership of Twitter slapped an unwarranted label on me, which effectively accuses me every day, every time a tweet of mine is read by someone, of committing a criminal offence of working for Russian state media, which I do not do and could not do it being illegal in Britain so to do. The Associated Press show that I made for the American multinational AP and which they, not me, sold to RT was of course taken off the air when RT was banned. At that time, I had no such label. This label was applied to me 
after I no longer had a show on RT. Try explaining that one in court, Mr. Musk. I know that you won't personally be there, but your agents will have to be, unless, of course, this case is settled. But much more serious things happened to other people than happened to me. One of my guests tonight, the military, diplomatic, scientific expert, Scott Ritter, was expurgated. He was expunged from Twitter for telling the truth about the Russia-Ukraine war, or at least the truth as he perceived it. Peter Hitchens of the biggest selling newspaper in Britain, the Daily Mail, Mail on Sunday, opined not a couple of hours ago that the Suez crisis divided Britain. Uh, the Vietnam War divided the world. The Iraq War divided the world. But it is not permitted to divide opinion on the Russia-Ukraine war. In fact, a cabinet minister said on television today that Britain's nurses must send Vladimir Putin a clear message by accepting their below inflation wage deal and therefore a cut in their standard of living. The idea that in the Kremlin, Mr. Putin is carefully watching what Britain's nurses settle for in the latest wage round, or that if the nurses take a pay cut, this will be consequential to Vladimir Putin in what way is not explained. Couldn't be explained by the Conservative minister in question, Nadim Zahawi. That's the man that charged the taxpayer to heat the stables in which he kept his racehorses. A billionaire, at least a multi-millionaire, like so many in Rishi Sunak, the billionaire's cabinet. But I digress. People have been purged off Twitter altogether. But what Elon Musk did by publishing Twitter files this week, in the last couple of days, was far more serious than that. It was evidence, clear and incontrovertible, that the 2020 presidential election was stolen for Joe Biden and the Democrats. Incontrovertible in that the emails and the internal messages and chats make absolutely abundantly clear that the company before Musk took it over, was receiving orders from Democratic Party panjandrums to block people, to remove people, and most crucially, to describe the Hunter Biden laptop, laptop story as Russian disinformation, a false claim that was attested to by no less than 51 former senior security and intelligence officials of the American state. But it was not Russian disinformation. Every word on the laptop turned out to be true, as has too late been acknowledged by the very newspapers, like the New York Times, which first branded it as Russian disinformation in the first place. So if it was not Russian disinformation, the false allegation that it was, was American disinformation. And moreover, disinformation that was being spread at the behest of one of the two main candidates in the presidential election. And when you see what was on the laptop, you know exactly why. Because if the information on the laptop had been before the American voters, before Election Day 2020, Joe Biden would have lost. Without a scintilla of doubt, he would have lost. Not because his son is a vile, debased pervert, and all of that is att uh, attested to 
on the laptop, including pictures taken by his own hand of him in sexually compromised situations with crack pipes in his mouth, smoking crack cocaine and cavorting with young women, some of them too young to be cavorting with him. Not for that reason, because Joe Biden could have said, I have an errant son, don't visit the sins of the son on the father. He might have claimed that. But much more seriously on the laptop was the information that Joe Biden, when vice president to Barack Obama, was up to his neck in financial corruption with foreign governments, principally the government of, you've guessed it, the Ukraine, that Joe Biden was the big guy who got a cut of the business being done in Ukraine by Hunter Biden with no qualification other than that he was the son of the Vice President of the United States. I'm talking tens of millions of dollars. And there's the big guy seeded throughout the laptop's contents. And I'm saying here now, Joe Biden can sue me if he likes that the big guy is him. We know that because we saw the big guy in action on the television ordering the Ukrainian government to sack their chief prosecutor because he was investigating the malfeasance being indulged in by Burisma an oil and gas company that was paying unaccountably Hunter Biden $100,000 a month for doing nothing. A crackhead, dishonorably kicked out of the US military, who never worked in oil and gas in his life, was getting $100,000 a month for not showing up at Burisma. And when the chief prosecutor bravely began investigating it. Joe Biden on television warned the Ukrainian government that in the dog days of the Obama administration, he would cost the Ukrainian government a billion dollars in American aid unless this chief prosecutor was sacked. The evidence on the laptop was clear, incontrovertible and would have cost Biden the election. That's why Twitter executives moved decisively into action. And it's all there in black and white. They decided falsely to brand this story as a Russian disinformation project and to expunge any reference to it in the entire three weeks before polling day in 2020. They shut down the Twitter account of the New York Post, a grand old newspaper, a legitimate part of the American journalistic landscape. They shut down their Twitter account because they had broken the story about Hunter Biden's laptop. Anyone who referred to it was suspended shadow banned, blocked or banned, every trace of the Hunter Biden laptop story was ruthlessly expunged by named Twitter executives and they all, all a lie. Now, of course, Twitter is entitled to publish or not publish anything that it likes, but it is not entitled to conspire with officials of what was in certain states like Arizona, about which more later, and would soon become, as a result of their activities, the government of the United States of America. That becomes a criminal offense against the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America.
it becomes a conspiracy to commit a criminal offense against the Constitution of the United States of America. It becomes, dear ladies and gentlemen, an act of treason against the United States. And whilst it's true that the BBC have not breathed a word of Twitter files or Elongate, as I like to call it, because he's the man that's opened the gates so that we can now all see what the man buns with the man bags in San Francisco were doing in charge of what they laughingly called the public square. Whilst it's true that the BBC, the Guardian, and the New York Times, and the Washington Post have not yet breathed the word of this scandal, this matter will now move into the courts of the United States. And probably, first of all, in Arizona. Arizona, you may recall, was a knife-edge contest where the counting suddenly stopped for many hours in the middle of the night and where, rather surprisingly, Donald Trump lost the election. Well, it turns out in the new revelations today in the Twittergate files that the high officials of the state of Arizona were literally hourly and certainly daily in touch with officials at Twitter to manipulate in a criminal way the circulation of truth, truthful information, which materially affected the result, even if nothing else did. And nothing else is unlikely to be all that happened in the case of Arizona. We'll be talking to a freedom rider in the United States about that in just a few minutes. But let me turn briefly as I must to Ireland, where my heart lies, my mother being herself Irish. Today, I learned that though a neutral country, though constitutionally bound to be a neutral country, a constitutional provision that is more honored in the breach than in the observance, as anyone who's ever been at Shannon Airport already knows, that the Irish state has entered into the Doyle a new bill with one single purpose, the purpose of banning the Chinese company Huawei from the marketplace in the Irish Republic. Now, I don't own a Huawei. I have nothing to do with Huawei. But I've got to ask this question. What did China ever do against Ireland? If the Irish politicians were entering bills which said we want nothing to do with the United Kingdom because it hangs on to a small part of our country whose reunification we demand, I could understand that. I would think it was diplomatically and politically foolish, but if the Irish wanted to boycott and ban British products, they would have at least a logical case that they could make. They could say, the British held us in bondage for many centuries. They continue to hold on to one of our four green fields. We want nothing to do with Britain. I could understand that. But what did China do to you, Ireland? Why are you disfiguring your own face in order to please Joe Biden, the fake Irishman in Washington and his NATO warmongering alliance, about which I close. I drive up and down the M6, it seems, several times a week. But today I pass something 
that I never have seen before. You know the Bob Dylan song, Masters of War? It was ringing in my ears as I came upon a convoy of at least 30 military vehicles that looked like they were serious, that were gleaming, freshly painted, and armed to the teeth. I wondered what on earth this military movement could be. It was a convoy of British nuclear weapons. There they are there. Four of them in these trucks, guarded, each of them, by multiple military vehicles. And in that truck is the wherewithal to incinerate every single living thing on this island. I just tried to explain to my child when I showed him this picture that there would be nothing left in Britain if an accident or an act of terrorism had intercepted that convoy today. Still less if the real terrorists in charge of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization were to unleash upon the world an exchange of these nuclear weapons in these trucks which would be answered in full and more than full by the Russian nuclear strike force with thousands of weapons at their disposal, traveling hypersonically. Those missiles are on their way to Glasgow. Glasgow would be a heap of smoking ash in minutes of the unleashing of this nuclear missile that is there in front of you and is still driving now north up the M6 to Faz Lane outside Glasgow where I was once arrested for protesting their existence and tossed into the Greenock jail under a filthy excrement smeared blanket. My point is this. It's the one that Peter Hitchens made in his statement earlier today. Suez, Vietnam, Iraq, were nothing like as important as the conflict that we are now deliberately entered into over a country whose whereabouts most of us don't know, whose cities none of us can pronounce, none of us can spell. And yet, our entry into this conflict spells the end for me, for you, for my children, for yours, for the children that they might have gone on to have. It spells the end of everything in Europe, in the world. Fasten your seat belts. It's going to be a bumpy night. You know, and it's a very, thank you for, you know, I, I'm a big fan of your show, Gigi. Great, great debate. Great. And I'm Scottish. I'm very passionate about what's happening there. You know, I had a great mom. She was Scottish, Mary McLeod. She taught me well. She taught me well at everything, including golf. I love Scotland and I love the Scottish food. It's great food. I said to Melania, you know, haggis. Look at that. What's more than more Scottish than that? Me. I am that haggis. She said, what, thin-skinned and full of crap? You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Get voting on this poll. It's very important that we get the maximum number of people on it. Did Twitter steal the 2020 presidential election? On my Twitter feed, it's yes, 79, 
no 21. On YouTube, it's yes, 85, no 15. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe to my channel. It costs you nothing. Just click the button. And while you're at it, click the thumbs up to say that you like the show. And on Telegram, t.me forward slash George Galloway, always the most perspicacious of our poll uh, community. It's yes, 84%, no, 16%. Here are the phone numbers, and they are, if you're in the UK and Ireland, 08 081 96 UK and Ireland, entirely free, 08 081 96 If you're in the US or Canada, Again, toll free. It's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the rest of the world, it's plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. You call us free of charge and we'll call you back. Now Isa Ali is a freelance journalist and political analyst with a focus on Middle Eastern politics. We'll be coming to him in a bit because England are playing a rather important football match against Senegal this evening. First up is the Freedom Rider herself, Margaret Kimberley, writer and executive editor of Black Agenda Report. It's a must to follow her Twitter feed, her Output is phenomenal. She has a new book, which we'll talk about. But Margaret, we've got to speak first about Elon Musk and what he has now revealed. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Very nice to make your acquaintance. Um, this, although most of the country and the world doesn't yet know it, is a matter of the gravest significance, is it not? Oh, it's very grave. Uh, you know, we don't know how that election would have turned out had uh, uh, the information about uh, Hunter Biden's laptop been um, more widely known by the public. But that's the whole point, that we don't know. Uh, it was pretty clear to me when Twitter, I hadn't known Twitter to ban any other subject altogether to say that you couldn't link to this article, that the New York Post had to be removed. I don't recall anything of that magnitude before. So it was clear to me that they were working with the Biden campaign. That was obvious to anyone who was paying attention. And that's why I think it's so important that this information has now come out. Uh, the liberal of course, are out in force. They are um, uh, dismissing this information. They are uh, attacking uh, Matt Taibbi, the, the journalist who revealed this information. But that's what they do. They walk in lockstep with the Democratic Party. But the rest of us should not do that. The rest of us should question this. The rest of us should not be afraid to say that the Democrats are um, an arm of, or rather the big tech is an arm of the Democratic Party. And this is uh, something that uh, so. is... Oh, absolutely. It's, it's very obvious. And uh, it's, it's very unfortunate for obvious reasons. But of course, it's still being politicized. We, what were we told in October of 2020? This is Russian disinformation. Now, mind you, Hunter Biden was silent. He never once denied that this was his laptop. He did not deny the email that said from an Ukrainian official to him, thank you so much. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, thank you so much for letting me meet your father, the vice president at the time as you point out. So we're talking about corruption. We are talking about uh, a major uh, media corporation taking obviously taking sides in a presidential election. Uh, these uh, big tech firms are very powerful, too powerful. I believe the, these social media platforms should be regulated as public utilities, not their content regulated, but their operations regulated so that they cannot do this 
anymore. But uh, we see why the other um, media giants that you mentioned, New York Times hasn't mentioned it. Of course, they're not going to mention it because they helped. They helped in the cover up too. And so this calls into question the very idea of democracy. Americans are always told we're a democracy, a democracy. And that means anything that shows we are, in fact, not a democracy has to be covered up. Well, you were told, uh, I read a thousand times, that democracy was on the ballot <laughs> in the midterms. But it turns out that democracy was murdered by the Democrats who were telling you that democracy is on the ballot two years later. Now, of course, any media house can take sides in an election. Almost all of them do. The problem is they were in cahoots with government officials, like the 51 intelligence uh, officers, mm -hmm. very senior ones, who named and their faces on the front page of the papers said that the Hunter Biden laptop story was Russian disinformation, but the disinformation was theirs. They are the people who deliberately deceive your country and its electorate. Oh, yes, absolutely. And that is where the, as you point out, where the First Amendment comes into play. Twitter can say what it wants. It can ban whomever it wants. But once they took direction from government officials, they violated the First Amendment. And that is why they didn't want anybody to know uh, about their actions. Uh, but this is not the first time. Uh, this has been going on, uh, I, especially since 26, the 2016 uh, election, the stories of Russian collusion, which have all been dis proven. And you don't have to be a Donald Trump supporter to point that out. We have had numerous instances of government officials um, telling the media what to say and what not to say. And we see the uh, people calling themselves journalists who are anything but they are violating the uh, ethics of their profession, and they're violating the law, violating the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. One of the things that we're always told makes a democracy a democracy, but it's uh, violated quite openly. So this is something that should concern everyone, regardless of their political affiliation, regardless how, of how they feel about Biden or about Trump. It is important for people to stand on principle, the principle of democracy that we're always told this country lives by. Quite so. I, I'm against Biden and Trump. Uh, but I, <laughs> I, as Malcolm said, uh, I, I'm for the truth. And for justice, no matter whom it's for, no matter whom it's against, that's the task for people like thee and me, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It should be, uh, regardless of our, and, and those of us who speak and write, we all have uh, opinions. We all take uh, positions on issues. That's what we're supposed to do. But we are not supposed to lie. We are not supposed to help the government uh, keep secrets from the people. But you see this pile on against Twitter, against uh, uh, Matt Taibbi, uh, the writer who is uh, telling this story. And, and by the way, the people attacking them, none of them are questioning the veracity of the information. It's personal attacks against him. It's attacks against Elon Musk. You can attack Elon Musk, but this is deceptive. This is dishonest. And we see a liberal class which is joined at the hip with the state. And all of the things that uh, liberals claim to believe in, they don't believe in. The people who are always talked about civil liberties, the people who always talked about freedom, they don't believe in it. They believe in their class. They believe in the politicians, the political party that they support. And everything else they claim to believe in is shoved under the bus when it's convenient. Well, uh, the great uh, journalist working out of Brazil these days, Glenn Greenwald, he mm -hmm. was making this very point uh, today, that what they are demonstrating, these uh, sleaze bags that are out there attacking Taibi 
uh, attacking Musk. Musk is big enough to look after himself. I'm, I'm myself taking him to court. Uh, but the, the, the journalist, Taibi, uh, is a man of unimpeachable journalistic integrity. The whole liberal gang is now trashing him. Thank and you. that's the point Greenwald is making. That, that uh, Well, I paraphrase now. Uh, that this is positively Orwellian. Lies are truth, war is peace. Uh, everything is turned on its head. People that are supposed to be and regard themselves around the, the dinner party tables as liberals and progressives who are absolutely joined at the hip with the FBI and the CIA and the deep organs of the military-industrial complex in the United States. And this is something, this is a moment where this is especially dangerous. I was listening to uh, what you were saying about what's going on in uh, your country and in Europe with Ireland giving up its neutrality to U.S. state power. Uh, your country recently, in effect, making any large-scale protest illegal. But they do this because they want to silence people. Uh, they have driven the world to the brink in uh, Ukraine. They're trying to do the same thing in China, and they do not want anyone to speak out. So Ireland will attack Huawei when they don't have any reason to, uh, and uh, the UK uh, government will uh, make it difficult, if not impossible, to have any protest about nuclear weapons, about foreign policy, about any subject. And I hope people ask themselves, what are they up to that they don't want us to protest? What are they so afraid of that they don't want uh, uh, people in the public square registering their opinion about Ukraine or about Russia claiming Vladimir Putin is uh, uh, the nurses can't strike because of Vladimir Putin? Uh, this is where it all begins. And we're seeing this totalitarianism we are always told comes from Russia or China or some other place. We're seeing it from the countries that always call themselves democracies. All the while, Margaret, uh, we're banning protests in Britain whilst hailing them in China. <laughs> you really couldn't uh, make it up. Let me turn to your wonderful book because uh, I, I love your Freedom Rider blog. Everyone yeah. should follow it. Uh, this book is about the African-American population, the black population of America, and mm -hmm. its relationship to the presidents. Some of the early ones, of course, of whom uh, kept black people as slaves. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, my book, Presidential Black America and the Presidents, I, uh, it's uh, 45 chapters from George Washington through Trump telling the story of uh, uh, black history through the presidency. Uh, 12 of the first 14 presidents were slaveholders. Uh, after that time, we have uh, uh, presidents who were segregationists. We have uh, Harry Truman as a young man, belonged to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, we have presidents who we were told were quote unquote good for black people, as the saying goes, uh, who did everything they could to subvert uh, the human rights of black people. We see even people like Barack Obama. Uh, the system is uh, does not allow anybody to rise to the presidency uh, unless they go along uh, with the establishment narrative and Obama himself would uh, personally make very negative comments of black, about black people. Uh, and his policies, he did not help black people. He would always dismiss uh, any um, request on his part to do any of the things that black people need and that as citizens, we had a right to ask for. Joe Biden, the current president, was a segregationist. He was the point person against busing uh, to achieve school uh, segre uh, desegregation, rather. He was the person who led the charge in the 90s against, uh, in favor of what was called the crime bill when he was a senator, passing this legislation which um, uh, increased mass incarceration. The U.S. has more people in prison than any country in the world, more than two million people. Um, and all the countries that we're told are bad are authoritarian 
authoritarian or dictatorships, none of them have a, as great a percent of their population uh, in jail as we do in this country. So uh, I felt it was very important for people to see uh, the presidents like Lincoln, who we were taught uh, wanted to end slavery. He did not. He wanted to send Black people out of the country. Or Franklin Roosevelt, who always sided with the Southern segregationists, or even John Kennedy, who had to be pushed, or Lyndon Johnson, who had to be pushed. Uh, so obviously, I think uh, the book is very good. So anyone interested in American history ought to read Presidential Black America and the Presidents. Where can people order it, Margaret? Uh, directly from the publisher, Steerforth Press, steerforth.com, from barnesandnoble.com, from Amazon, uh, from Audible. I, I narrate the book uh, myself, and it's also an ebook, which they can also get at steerforth.com. Well, look, I always say this, but I don't always mean it. It's actually been a privilege interviewing you this evening, Margaret Kimberly, the Freedom Rider blog. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Did Twitter steal the 2020 presidential election? Yes, 79%. No, 21%. YouTube, 85% to 15%. Telegram, 84% to 16%. Coming up after a very short break, it's the World Cup. Don't miss it. in 130 countries and territories around the world. And we are in the top 10 in the United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, where we're number one, Croatia, Egypt, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Poland, and Nigeria, and even the Cayman Islands, even the tax dodgers. There's new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. You can listen to the very best of moats anywhere. And at any time, you can also get the episodes a day earlier if you are a supporter of mine on Patreon. All my live shows, it's my extensive podcast archive, my audio books narrated by me. So please uh, consider supporting me on Patreon and get your Moats podcast wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a five star review, will you? Thousands of people are voting on this uh, Twitter poll. Did Twitter steal the 2020 presidential election? As revealed, actually, by Elon Musk, the much uh, criticized and indeed controversial magnate who paid $44 billion for the company and full disclosure against whom I have a legal action in the Dublin courts because Dublin, believe it or not, is where they're headquartered. Dublin, the same Dublin, that has decided to make parliamentary legislative moves against the Chinese company Huawei for no discernible reason other than to please the United States of America. This at a time when Germany has told the United States that it will not be banning Huawei and has no intention of following Joe Biden off a second cliff, uh, not just Russia, but China as well. Uh, the telephone numbers I've given you already. Uh, comments on YouTube are uh, plentiful. Uh, Rix195 says, get the humans counting the votes like we do here in Britain, not voting machines which can be rigged and programmed to favor a candidate. Well, even some of the humans are uh, dubious if you ask me. Morn's lad says, Ireland swapped British colonialism for EU diktat. It is a very small stooge for both Brussels and Washington. So it just adapts anti-Russian and anti-Chinese uh, policies. Super chats are coming in. You know I'm planning in the new year to launch a Friday night, late, late Friday night in UK uh, time, uh, uh, Moats America, and we're fundraising for it. Best way to give is on the Super Chat. 
if you're watching on YouTube and you just go to the Super Chat mechanism, make a donation, give me a comment, I'll read it out. But if you're not watching on YouTube, you can go to our email, our uh, website, which is moats.tv, and you can donate there. Albert Sontag, a very generous and regular donor, sends $20. Upwards and onwards, George says. Albert, thank you so much. Teresa Kelly, my good friend in the United States, sends 100 US dollars. Mr. Lover, a regular donor, gives two pounds. Don't be afraid to give a small amount. If everybody gave one pound, one euro, one dollar, we would be, we'd already be launching uh, the Moats America. Uh, Darren Henry in New Zealand sends 99 cents. Thanks, Darren. Michael Zemrowski sends five euros. Don't thank you. Thank you, Venetia Williams. Thank you, Michael and Venetia. David Fox gives 14.99 Australian dollars. Thanks, David. And Ange, 20.99, another regular donor, gives two pounds for the good fight. Thank you, Ange. Remborn, another huge and generous donor, gives 50 British pounds. I hope to meet you someday, Remborn. I'm telling you guys, gives 199 pounds. Thank you, Brian McGuigan, 50 British pounds. And Ingramosh gives 10 euros. George, since you've kindly refused running in Germany, any piece of advice for the hardworking and aware German people seeing their country being intentionally destroyed by its puppet government? I was just talking earlier about one of my very best friends in my life, the late Uwe Brandt of Berlin. Uh, who was a prisoner of war in Liverpool and was kept there until 1947, uh, digging uh, roads. I never knew that prisoners of war could be kept for two years after the war ended, but went back to Berlin and became, in the end, uh, one of the directors of Mercedes-Benz. A very, very kind and very German, courteous uh, gentleman, and I loved him uh, very dearly. What the Germans can do is get rid of little soldier Schultz and his, his monstrosity of a so-called Green Party alliance. I don't care who runs Germany, but not them. I have nothing in common politically with Angela Merkel at all. But if she were still running Germany, Germany would not be playing the role in this insane onslaught in Ukraine that it is under the so-called social democrat, little soldier Schultz. Marie Theresa Hughes gives five pounds. Thank you, Marie Theresa. Uh, Frankie says, I'm very disappointed and amazed by Ireland's weakness and subservience to America. What has happened to the Ireland of old? Well, uh, you and me both, uh, Frankie, we've got to hope that uh, changes are coming in Ireland and that that change will mean meaningful change in Ireland's role in the world. Paul is on the line in Canada, in Ottawa, about Twitter. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, hello, George. Thanks for having me again. Hope all is well. Welcome. Good, good to hear you. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. Uh, so the reveal that Elon Musk did with, you know, showing that Twitter actually engaged in systematic cut down of information that should have been is at this point kind of irrelevant um, because we all know this if you've been if, if you had ears and eyes plugged into what was going on we know it, it has been authenticated the laptop so really to show that well, well we it's not uh, Paul 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 it's not irrelevant when people start getting arrested and uh, I fully expect arrests uh, to follow this. It's as clear, if the First Amendment means anything at all, it precludes officials of the government conspiring with the media to deny freedom of speech of the citizens. That's not just a crime, it's a conspiracy against the American people and their constitution. Am I not right? 
Absolutely. And I, I really hope you're right that it rests. But I personally don't think a scintilla of anything is going to happen to anybody. This is, I mean, we're speculating into the future. Believe me, I hope you're right. But I'm more of a skeptic about these uh, yahoos and that, that Elon Musk, I mean, if then he would be a hero in my mind if that's the outcome. I just don't think, because we all knew it was happening anyway. It has been authenticated. They're going into, uh, they could be hitting Facebook too. With a, if we really wanted to, we could. We didn't need to have the CEO or the owner of the company say, I'm going to reveal it. The courts could have said, why well, did sure, you? But the, but, the, but the evidence, well, because there's a new owner who's opened the books. And I think we have to be forever grateful to Musk. He could have covered all this up. He could have quit the whole Twitter imbroglio in the first place, just written off the losses. He is worth $300 billion after all. But he decided to open the books and open the floodgates of liberal fury against him. Uh, But there are plenty of places. I'm giving you one. Arizona. There'll be arrests in Arizona. That's my confident prediction, because high officials of the state of Arizona are revealed today to have been engaged in a conspiracy against their own people under the terms of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Paul, we'll see who's right. Thanks for that call. Rafael is in Costa Rica. I always like to tour the horizon. Raf, go ahead. Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure, Mr. Galloway, and all your audience. I'm calling from Costa Rica, as you said, and basically I'd like to stress, Mr. Galloway, on the striking and at the same time revealing similarity I see between the case of the Twitter files by Elon Musk and the persecution that Julian Assange has had to endure for more than a decade. And I'd like to stress yep. to, especially to the American audience, but actually to the to the world as a whole, uh, on how the very same people that crafted uh, the intelligence uh, process to persecute Assange are the same ones who, as you have very well said, uh, carried out the, the the police state persecution and cover up. Of the of the Twitter of the Twitter case uh, uh, reported by by Elon Musk on the 2020 election. Yeah, there's every similarity. Uh, the uh, Matt Taby is a truth teller, and he is in receipt of a deluge of filth from people that call themselves uh, liberals. Uh, Julian Assange, likewise. Sure, the New York Times and The Guardian and so on have made a very, very late and little uh, attempt to avoid Julian's extradition to the United States just in the last few days. All these newspapers, by the way, fed on the dripping roast of stories that Julian revealed through WikiLeaks of malfeasance, high crimes and misdemeanors of governments around the world, particularly of the war crimes of the so-called coalition of the killing in the Iraq war, the Afghan war, and so on. Uh, Both these men are uh, receiving uh, the full measure uh, of, uh, of state fury at what they have done. And in Julian's case, his very life has been perhaps fatally undermined over these last years. And if he goes to the U.S. to a hanging judge in, uh, in Arlington, Virginia, which is where he would be tried uh, with a jury of the peers of Arlington, who are, of course, the headquarters of the CIA, he will never be seen again. For the rest of his life, he'll be in a deep dungeon. And if people want to go quietly into that good night, Uh, then you and I have done everything we can to try and stop them. So far, we have not succeeded. But I promise them that if Julian dies in a dungeon, then something even more precious than Julian Assange will have died 
with him. Uh, now, we're still unable to get uh, Isa Ali. Uh, apparently, there's some big game going on in, uh, in Doha, and all the phone lines, all the signals are jammed. But we'll do everything that we can to get him in the course of the second hour of the show. Let me read some more comments. Uh, Moriokiri says, Elon, the hero who called the Thai cave rescuer a pedo guy and offered $50,000 to dig up dirt on him for calling Elon's plan a PR stunt. I'm not sure why you would direct that to me, the man that is taking him to court in Dublin. Uh, what you say may or may not be true, but what is incontestably true is that he published the Twitter files. Try to see the big picture here. Try not to concentrate on the smaller hill that is obscuring your view. Stand up straight, lift your head, throw back your shoulders. Try and see the big picture and stop being so stupid. Uh, super uh, more. Uh, we've got loads of them, but let me take a call from Stuart in Scotland on media and on Twitter. Stuart, go ahead, my friend. Hiya, George. How are you doing? Good. Good. By the grace of God, good. Thanks. What would you like to say? <laughs> uh, I'm just calling up. See, uh, you're talking about Iraq and uh, the disinformation and whatnot. Do you not think that uh, the these so-called... Uh, is it ultrasonic missiles or something like that? Russia has is uh, a bit of disinformation. Hi hypersonic, yeah. Hypersonic, yeah. Hyperso you think they're disinformation? Well, really? They, well, I think I think uh, all the weapons that the West has, and then the weapons that Russia has, I think we've got a bit of a cheek to be pointing the finger and going, "Well, you can't have these and whatnot just because they've outgunned us." No, uh, there's no cheek involved, Stuart. I have spent my whole life trying to get rid of all nuclear weapons, including the ones. Uh, somewhere near you uh, that uh, would spell the end for everybody near you. I got thrown in jail for it. So uh, I'm against these weapons, whomsoever holds them. I'm against uh, war and uh, invasion, whomsoever's doing the war and invading. And so I, I fail to see your point. It is NATO that is uh, caused the war in Ukraine, unless you're one of the dwindling number who thinks that one morning Vladimir Putin woke up and decided to invade his next door neighbor. Are you one of those? No, no, I'm not one of those, George. Actually, I believe that we are the cause of that. Uh, but I believe that uh, a lot of what we see is disinformation. You talked about uh, the censoring of uh, freedom of speech and whatnot. I've got a uh, a few accounts on social media and whenever I talk about this thing about the disinformation and about how we are only given one uh, narrative of the story you know like that I'm I'm shut down I've had my I'm actually on a 29 day block on my Facebook because I commented on something in America uh, that was happening in America and it was relative to the the story that was happening in America but because we have certain words in this country that are triggered on social media Instantly, you get blocked. It's not even you're not even you can't even appeal that because it's a computer that does it. Our our censorship in in the UK is because we don't have the what is it the Second Amendment they have in in America or the First Amendment that protects their freedom of speech. We don't have this in this country. Yeah, well, they've got uh, no. That's right. Uh, on the face of it, America is a freer country than we are. Uh, that never used to be true uh, in practice, but we had no constitution. We have no constitution. That'll surprise a lot of the overseas listeners, watchers. We have no constitution. We have no Bill of Rights. We are not even citizens here, Stuart. We are subjects. That's what we are officially called. We are subjects of big daft Charles, King Charles. We're his subjects. We have no rights. Now, in practice, we used to be able to exercise rights, like protest, like free speech, as long as we could find a soapbox and a megaphone, because we wouldn't get on the television or in the newspapers to express our point of view. But all of that is disappearing. As I said earlier, 
to uh, Margaret Kimberley, we are praising protests in China whilst literally banning protests in Britain. Our country's gone to the dogs, Stuart. Thank you, Carl. No, you've not been cut oh. off. You're on. Carry on. <laughs> no, no, I 100% agree with you about, uh, about our freedom of speech being totally uh, tainted. Because what's happening is, I think we're getting one side of the story, and then if you speak out against that side of the story, uh, then it automatically you're banned. You know, you're automatically you're shut down straight away, you know. And I think that's how we're not getting the full picture. You know, like speaking about Ukraine and Russia, we're not getting the full picture from them because because of our media, you know, like, and you're saying about America, the First Amendment. Well, that's like a that. fact. Look, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't have, yeah, we don't have that. Uh, and this uh, technology has never been greater. There's never been more media attention on a war with less actual footage of the war. Think about it. The Vietnam War had far more footage for the public to see than the Ukraine war does. Our coverage is total propaganda and a good measure of invention. Let me take a quick break, but in the second hour, we've got the one and only Scott Ritter coming up. You want to hear the truth about the Russia-Ukraine war? This is the place to find it. I'll be right back. I get a lot of abuse from people in America that don't listen properly. They imagine that because I am viscerally hostile to Joe Biden and the so-called Democrats, that that means I'm a supporter of the Republicans and of Donald J. Trump. Neither of those is true. I'm not with either of these two big parties, two cheeks of the same backside. Even if we could agree which was the lesser attractive cheek, I still wouldn't be prepared to choose between them. I'm one of those that calls on, let me do so again here and now, my good friend Jimmy Dore to run as a third party candidate for the People's party of America for a third force to emerge. That's what I want to see in America. And I'm more than happy to give whatever advice and experience that I myself have to any people of goodwill who want to build that third force. As I've said before, if my good friend, Dr. Jill Stein, were to be the Green Party nominee again, I would, of course, support her for President of the United States. If Tulsi Gabbard would run as an independent presidential candidate, I would support her. I would not be happy to see Donald Trump back in the White House, but I'd be very, very happy if Joe Biden wasn't. I'd be very, very happy if Kamala Harris wasn't, even if that meant that Donald Trump would have another term as president of the United States. You see my point? I regard the US Democrats as the greatest threat to peace on the planet. I believe that the world is much more dangerous with Biden and Harris and the Democrats in power. And therefore, I'd be happier if anybody could replace them as president of the United States. Doesn't mean I've become a Republican, at least not a US Republican. It doesn't mean I've become Trumpist or a devotee of the great orange Hulk. I'm not either of those things. But I've got to tell you, I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are a clear and present danger to the American Republic. And even more importantly, from my point of view, for a clear and present danger to the peace of the world. Avoid World War III. Get rid of Joe 
Bye, Dan. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. That's what I thought last week. I think it even more uh, now. That was on Wednesday that went out for the first time. And it's Sunday. And the clear and present danger to the American Republic, represented by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the so-called Democratic Party of the United States, is even more vividly obvious, at least to me. Now, Scott Ritter is a man that I have known for uh, well over 20 years. Uh, I have the highest opinion of his military knowledge. He was an intelligence officer in the United States Marine Corps. He was a distinguished arms expert and disarmament officer of the United Nations disarmament operation in Iraq. He's a man that told the truth about Iraq. He's a man that's telling the truth about the Russia Ukraine affair. And he's paid a very high price for both of these things. It's always a pleasure and a privilege to have him here on the Mother of All Talk Show. Scott Ritter, I welcome you again on behalf, I think, of all of our uh, viewers. Uh, we wait to hear your take on the developments in the war. I generally let you just speak, but I have a question for you. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, made a crucial slip-up in a video recently in which she revealed that the Ukrainian armed forces had lost dead 100,000 soldiers. So alarming uh, was this that she quickly put out a second video without the number. But no one denies the number. The EU refuses to deny the number. If it's a true number, 100,000 dead soldiers in 10 months must mean, by rubric that I've heard you express before, 200 to 300,000 wounded and maimed soldiers making the best part of half a million casualties in 10 months of a war that we keep getting told Ukraine is winning. Your comments, please. Well, first of all, let's talk about the numbers that uh, the distinguished um, head of the European Commission put out there. Um, I think that they are wrong numbers. I think they're low. Um, I think they're numbers that are reflective of the official uh, dialogue that takes place between the Ukrainian government and their European, NATO, and American allies. Um, but we have to remember that Ukraine is one of the most corrupt nations on the planet. Uh, there's a petition that has been signed by uh, Ukrainian wives and uh, mothers uh, that are asking for the status of upwards of 320,000 men uh, they want to know where they've gone, what's happened to them, why aren't they writing home, why aren't they phoning home. Um, these are missing. Um, that's a lot larger number. And I, I think the wounded also are uh, significantly larger. I think the Ukrainians are suppressing uh, the truth of the losses. They're horrendous. I mean, 100,000 is mind-blowing. But you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, I think the, the number is probably closer to a quarter million. Um, and then you can extrapolate the wounded. Uh, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, as this war unfolds, as Russian uh, reinforcements arrive, as Russia begins uh, significant offensive combat operations against a Ukrainian military that has been significantly degraded over the last couple of months, um, I use as a historical analogy uh, you know, the, the destruction of uh, Army Group Center. That's the destruction of a German Army Group um, in, on the Soviet front in the summer of 1944. But we can also liken it to uh, Operation Cobra, where uh, the Americans and the British broke out of the Normandy uh, bridgehead and drove the Germans back in pell-mell defeat. Um, it was a slaughter of German troops on both sides. And I'm fearful for the Ukrainian people that we're going to see a similar slaughter of Ukrainian troops in the not-so-distant future. 
Well, these numbers are, uh, I was going to say Second World War type numbers, but actually they're closer to First World War casualty figures, aren't they? Well, I mean, Second World War had uh, battles that produced significant losses, but you're right. Uh, you know, we're looking at some some battles right now that, uh, you know, upwards of a thousand men are dying a day. And that's World War One type numbers. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, they're dying in trench warfare. They're dying under artillery bombardment. Uh, there are Ukrainian soldiers that are going to the front thinking that they're going to close with and engage the Russian enemy in close combat. And they, uh, they spend their entire tour um, under artillery fire, never once seeing the Russians uh, and seeing upwards of 60 to 70 percent of their unit uh, killed or wounded before they're eventually withdrawn, totally demoralized uh, to, in an effort to regroup. Uh, and that's World War I type, uh, type combat. The, we keep learning that inventories uh, of armaments in the NATO countries are, uh, are, are at rock bottom. Uh, some countries refuse to give requested uh, military aid to Ukraine because that would leave them literally defenseless without uh, weapons to defend their own country. The Financial Times of all people this week said that uh, one of the least predicted outcomes of the war so far is that the Russians have demilitarized NATO by forcing them to uh, expend almost all of the weapons inventory that they had. What are the Ukrainians doing with these weapons? Uh, they're dying. They're receiving these weapons. They go into combat and uh, these weapons get destroyed. Uh, the men manning the weapons get killed. Uh, in the case of the artillery pieces, uh, the Ukrainians... Um, you know, fire off as many rounds as they can. And, you know, during the Gulf War, uh, the United States military, this is 1991, we fired 60,000 rounds of artillery for the entire conflict. Uh, the Ukrainian military is firing upwards of 20,000 rounds a day. Uh, when, when we provide them with NATO standard 155 millimeter artillery pieces like the M777, the M109, and others, um, they use... This, this NATO standard ammunition. Um, but NATO didn't hasn't planned for expenditures of this rate. I mean, I don't know what NATO has been doing for the last 20 years, but they obviously haven't been planning for a large-scale ground conflict in Europe, despite um, articulating that Russia was somehow the threat worthy of uh, the enlargement of NATO. Um, the United States produces around a quarter of a million 155 millimeter rounds per year. Um, many, much of that's used for training, and the rest of it's used to keep stocks up to date as they retire um, expired ammunition. Uh, when you provide the Ukrainians with, say, a quarter of a million rounds of ammunition, uh, we might think that that's going to last several months. Um, the, the reality is it lasts two weeks, and then the Ukrainians need more. And after a while, we don't have any more to give. Uh, the, there's some talk in the media that uh, the British Army um, which, by the way, I just want to make the following point. The World Cup is going on right now, and you have many stadiums that can seat, you know, 100, 110 plus thousand people. You could put the entire British Army in a soccer stadium and still have about 40,000 seats free. So the British Army, as small as it is, um, will run out of ammunition in two days in a large ground combat, two days. The American Army would probably run out of ammunition in two weeks. NATO this, this is war losing numbers, um, meaning that if NATO were ever to engage in a conflict with a, a, an enemy like Russia um, and you run out of ammunition against an enemy that uses artillery to dominate the battlefield, it's game, set, match Moscow from the start. Um, NATO is never able to fight uh, Russia in its modern configuration, its post-Cold War configuration. NATO isn't organized, equipped, or trained to fight Russia, but now they don't have the logistic sustainability to do it even in a fantasy scenario. So um, what this is doing, I think this war is actually doing NATO a favor because it's allowing NATO to understand that if it goes to war, it will lose. It will lose decisively. 
So maybe don't go to war. This is the thought that should be in the head of everybody who wears a uniform in NATO today, that we should tell our diplomats to stop talking about aggressive posturing towards Russia, because the last thing NATO wants, needs, or even can survive in is a meaningful conflict with Russia. I'll come to the politicians in a minute, uh, but I, I, one of the reasons why I asked you that question, and thanks for that uh, incredible, powerful answer, is that President Buhari of Nigeria says that there's evidence in his possession that weapons that were given to Ukraine are showing up in the Chad Basin in the hands of uh, Islamist uh, throat-cutting madmen uh, of uh, the likes of Boko Haram and other Islamist groups uh, who are to be found in that Chad uh, Basin. And if uh, the president of Nigeria is correct, then it would seem that the oft-predicted leakage of the weaponry that's being sent to Ukraine is beginning to happen, first in Africa, but maybe uh, ultimately to uh, a bank hold up near us. No, you're 100% correct. Um, that which many people, including you and myself, have been uh, fearfully predicting is becoming reality. The <laughs> I don't know what the United States, Europe, NATO, and everybody who's been providing weapons to Ukraine was thinking when you hand over without any formal uh, accounting mechanism in place, um, massive quantities of weaponry. Now, you know, tanks, armored fighting vehicles, artillery pieces, these aren't weapons that are easily transported across borders. Javelin missiles, in-law missiles, stinger missiles, machine guns, ammunition, grenades, landmines, uh, portable um, suicide drones, these are. And these weapons have been turned over to the most corrupt nation state in Europe, Ukraine, at a time when the rule of law has ceased to exist. So the corruption has no checks and balance right now. This Ukrainian military is a military that has been taken over by criminal elements. The Azov Battalion, the Idar Battalion, the Safari Unit, the, the Kraken Battalion. We can go on and on, tens of thousands even more of these neo-Nazi white supremacist criminal elements whose links aren't to normal governments, but to the underworld, to the black market, to the criminal element. And these are corrupt people who recognize the opportunity they've been given because of the careless behavior of the West to take this man transportable, this easily transportable um, free money, and instead of using it as it was intended to fight the Russians, to have it filter back, and now it's appearing on the markets in Africa, it's appearing on the markets in Europe, it's going to appear on every market in the world, and the world has only the United States, NATO, the European Union to blame. We could have instituted a system of accounting, as is normally done when you're dealing with weapons of this lethality. You account for them. Every time they're expended, officers write a report, it goes back to the logistics, and it can be taken off a list. We have no clue what's happened to these weapons. And this was done uh, with, with malice of forethought because it wasn't as if the people who provided the weapons to Ukraine didn't know what the reality was. They can't say this was a mistake. They did this knowing full well what the outcome was going to be because they were seeking a political um, you know, a, a moment where they could say, we are being strong, look how strong we are. But it wasn't a moment that had any geopolitical significance in terms of advancing their cause. It was a moment that gave them short-term political benefit for long-term political cost or, or real cost for the rest of the world. Sometimes, uh, like a, a glimpse of sunlight on a cloudy day, we read and see uh, a vision of, uh, of uh, President Macron. Uh, I appreciate that it's not often he looks like a ray of sunshine, but uh, one such glimpse was uh, yesterday or today in which he said, to my absolute astonishment, that we not only need a security architecture 
which includes Russia, we have to address Russia's legitimate concern that NATO is turning up on Russia's doorstep with weapons systems, missiles on Russia's doorstep. This is the same President Macron who was in Washington last week meeting President Biden. Do you think he said the same thing to Biden or is it one thing for one audience, one thing for another? Well, one never knows with Macron because um, hey, um, Emmanuel, if you had had this same mindset back in December when Russia turned over a draft treaty to NATO for the consideration of all European members of NATO, including France, about the very issues you just addressed, had you shown this mindset then and said, we need to sit down with the Russians and address this issue, there would have been no war in Ukraine. Russia said, if you're willing to talk with us, this is how we want to solve the problem diplomatically. But if you ignore us, we'll have no choice but to go the military technical route. So why is Macron saying this now? Uh, he's saying it because he's waking up the reality that Russia is winning and is going to win, and there's nothing NATO can do to prevent this. So he's trying to create a framework for a negotiated settlement, but it's a discussion that's taking place internally within NATO. Um, Russia's not listening. Why would Russia ever listen to Emmanuel Macron again? Emmanuel Macron, France, was part of the Normandy format that was supposed to pressure Ukraine to implement the Minsk Accords. We now know, thanks to Petro Poroshenko and Angela Merkel, that Minsk was never intended to be implemented. It was always a vehicle to buy time for NATO to train a Ukrainian armed force to forcefully retake the Donbass and, and of course, according with their own fantasies, Crimea. And Macron was part of that. Macron and his diplomats stood face to face with their Russian counterparts in October of last year when the Russians pleaded for them to implement Minsk, that war could be avoided. And Macron said, no, we're not going to do that. So who knows what Emmanuel control, uh, uh, Macron's telling people? Did, what did he say to Biden? What's he saying today? He's a confused individual because he's on the wrong side of history and on the losing cause right now. And he's de desperate for a solution. But he needs to understand that in order for there to be a, a no negotiated agreement with Russia, Russia has to trust France. Russia will never trust France again, not as long as Emmanuel Macron is the president, because France has shown itself to be eminently untrustworthy, just like the UK has, just like Germany has, just like NATO has, just like the United States has. This is a conflict that will not be settled by negotiation, tragically. This is a conflict that will be settled on the battlefield, on the terms dictated by the victorious party, and that victorious party is going to be Russia. Scott, there's uh, a man called Ian Puddock, a big supporter of the show and a big supporter and admirer of yours. He sent us a question for you, a video one. Uh, bear with me while I uh, play it and uh, give us your answer, please. Mm -hmm. uh, let's hear from Ian Puddock. Uh, good evening, George. Good evening, Scott. Um, seasons, greetings and all that. Um, my question to Scott and George is Colonel McGregor has uh, talked about um, the plans of the US having a government in waiting to take over when obviously uh, Putin falls, the economy crashes, uh, we take over, divide up Russia and obviously the oligarchs go back and, uh, and start running the country. Um, will the, my question is to, to both of you is do you honestly believe the American people would just put up with that or would accept that? Um, it's based on the history of America doing this to so many different countries and it never works. It always goes wrong. Uh, and there's never an exit strategy. Um, I would just love, love to know your thoughts. Obviously, it's not going to happen. Fingers crossed. Cheers. Over, over to you, Scott. Uh, this is the kind of... Um, Ian does a fair bit of work around the uh, Ministry of Defence and so on. Uh, this is the kind of scuttlebuck that he uh, picks up. For me, it shows the fantasy world in which these people are living in, but you may have a different view. Well, first of all, I want to compliment Ian on his uh, sartorial look. It's uh, it was very holiday-like, and uh, <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah. But uh, the question is, is, is actually founded um, 
in in reality, and I don't mean reality as if what Colonel McGregor and others have spoken about is going to happen, but the reality that the policy being pushed by the Ukrainian government together with their MI6 and CIA controllers is a policy designed to create through information warfare, because it's not going to happen on the ground. They, what they're looking for is to dishearten the Russian people, to demoralize the Russian people to such an extent that there will be meaningful domestic opposition to Vladimir Putin. Uh, there will be a Moscow Maidan. That's a term that is used by the Ukrainian government, a term that has been planted in the Ukrainian government by MI6. This is a British con uh, concept, the Moscow Maidan, where the Russian people rise up together with oligarchs and other Solovki men of power who are frustrated by Vladimir Putin's impotence as a leader. So they're going to remove him and then replace him with something. And so the idea is that the CIA and the British are waiting in the wings with this government in exile, handpicked people that are already in Moscow. Now, understand what we're saying here. To accept this at face value, you have to believe that the CIA and the British have the ability to have a government in waiting in Moscow, which means there is no security service in Russia. Putin's that much incompetent. They're planting this idea, not for you and I to have this conversation, but for Russians to sit there and start calling each other up going, man, is this real? Is Putin that weak? Uh, is, uh, is the, is, are the Americans and the British there? And to create, because Putin's riding high on, on a, a you know wave of approval. The idea is to create through information warfare a mechanism that brings him down, that lowers the approval rate to make this happen. It is 100% pure fantasy, so much so that I believe a State Department official came out just the other day and said there's no indication that um, the, 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 the Putin government is, uh, you know, on the verge of being overthrown through popular discontent. It's, it's, it's not going to happen. But for a while, that was the, that's the whole purpose of, you know, when you turn on your computer in the morning, uh, all the stories that scroll out, you know, Vladimir Putin dying of cancer, drop the pen, shaky Jake, can't walk. Um, the Russian military, incompetent, retreating, deserting, crying for mama. The Russian generals committing suicide, dying, Russian equipment breaking. The Ukrainians are the strongest, most virile men in the world. Uh, and you read all this stuff and you're going, whoa. And it's not, again, for us. The Russians are some of the most internet savvy people in the world. They are plugged in to all this. They're watching this program. They watch every program. And the idea by flooding the, 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 the field, so to speak, with this disinformation is to sow seeds of doubt amongst the Russians. But when you're that internet savvy, you know, th these aren't children. They're not going to take your candy. These are adults who recognize exactly what's going on. And it's, it has backfired. Vladimir Putin today is as has very solid support. Uh, his policies are generally approved, especially when it comes to this war. And there's no chance. Uh, you can take a snowball and throw it in a fireplace, and that snowball has a better chance of surviving than this policy, this this fantasy has of becoming truth. Well, as you and I both know. Uh, no names, no pack drill. Uh, our intelligence services are more Austin Powers than James Bond, as is demonstrated over decades. Scott Ritter, a phenomenal interview that will fly far, I predict. Thanks for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Much uh, appreciated. Now, coming up right after this very short break, we've got through to Qatar, where... Apparently, England are winning out the park, which I confidently predicted before the game. I'll be right back. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out, pallid green, and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed, into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly, a humped shape rose out of the pit, and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out 
after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. It's a truly great work of art, The War of the Worlds. I hope you think I'm doing it justice. Uh, my my uh, audio book uh, in the making is, for the moment, chapter by chapter on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. England are winning 3-0, and when we get him on the line, Isa Ali will tell us about the continuing political ramifications, reverberations uh, of, uh, of, of the decision to send the World Cup to Qatar in the first place. I've just watched the Netflix documentary on FIFA and uh, I'd like to hear what Isa has to say about that. But some calls first. Raphael, another second Raphael of the night, this one in Vermont in the United States. Raphael, welcome to the show. Hey, guys, nice show. I, I, I want to say hi to everybody. Uh, I, I want to say something that I see the media is not saying anything about it. Even, the, even like our independent media is, for the, past, this, for the past few days, big things are happening. And people are not, I don't know if they don't understand, Russia is putting together one of the largest military base in in in, in that uh, in that area. They just in Manupol, Manupol. So we're talking about a base almost 500 miles from Moscow. So that means they got everything they wanted. That line of protection they wanted. So once you put that base there. So they're gonna put that. They're gonna put their S seven hundred there. So that means all Europe gonna be covered. So, so it seems like people don't see what's happening. Like yesterday, one of I don't know if this is like a American submarine or a British submarine. They got like one of those torpedoes that 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 flew by it at a speed that they never seen before. So. That means things is happening. Russia is moving forward. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, yeah. I'll tell you what's happening, uh, Raphael. Uh, Russia has multiply uh, been invaded from the West through the territory that is now Ukraine, but was formerly Russia and then uh, formerly part of the Soviet Union. Don't forget, Kiev was the capital of Russia. Yeah, not a lot of people know that, as Michael Caine would say. The Queen Mother, uh, in the last days of, uh, of Nicholas and Alexandra, uh, had uh, taken herself off to her, her palace in Kiev. Uh, and multiple times, most notably by Napoleon and then by Adolf Hitler, uh, Russia has been invaded from the West. Given that the Soviet Union no longer exists and the big hinterland uh, that uh, was uh, what the Soviet Union represented, the uh, NATO forces, if they'd wanted to invade, would have had to fight their way through socialist Poland and uh, socialist Ukraine. Uh, given that that's no longer the case, Russia's two major cities, biggest cities, most important cities, St. Petersburg and Moscow, are dangerously close to the border with NATO. And as Macron has belatedly and publicly stated today, that's a legitimate security concern that has to be negotiated away. Uh, and as Scott Ritter just told us, if it had been last December, so 12 months ago, there would have been no 
war in Ukraine. But now that there is, it's too late to say, let's get round a table and discuss what we refused to discuss 12 months ago, because of course, trust is broken, as Scott Ritter said, and Russia will not take anything that Macron or Schultz or whoever the latest Prime Minister of Britain is, I almost forget myself, we've had so many in these last months, or Joe Biden, who is here today, gone tomorrow and might not even actually be all there uh, today. That's the situation that we're in, Raphael. Thanks uh, indeed for that call. We now have our man in Doha, Isa Ali, the writer and analyst on the line. I hope with pictures. Uh, let's see. Isa, thanks. Uh, finally, we were able to get you. England are through uh, quite comfortably, 3 nothing up at the moment. France now await them. Uh, that's not going to be easy, either for England or for uh, France. But I'm not so uh, interested in the actual football games, though by all means give me uh, your thoughts on that. But I just watched the Netflix documentary on FIFA, and here's my take. If FIFA had get, not given the World Cup to South Africa, then Russia, then Qatar, they would have saved themselves a hell of a lot of trouble. If they'd given the World Cups to England and America, as was confidently expected and fought for, none of the negativity around FIFA today would be present. That's my take. What's yours? Hey, George, great to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. Look, at the end of the day, uh, the attitude towards FIFA and its uh, previous president, Sepp Blatter, is similar to the attitude that these people have uh, portrayed or displayed towards Qatar, the host of this World Cup, which is that, as far as they seem to be concerned, uh, this is an Anglophone world. Uh, not only Anglo phone nations exist, only Western nations exist. Everything should be centered around them. They need to realize the World Cup is the World Cup. There's a big world out there. And European and North American populations make up maybe 10% uh, of the world's population, if that. And uh, as a result, they're not the center of everything. And they're not going to get everything. And they're not going to host everything as much as they'd like to host the World Cup every four years. Now, you know, there are people who have said, you know, Qatar has no football pedigree, has no football history. Why is it hosting this World Cup? I'd counter that and say, what football pedigree does Canada have? What football pedigree does the United States have? None. Zero. Zilch. And yet they're hosting the next World Cup. In 94, the US hosted the World Cup. Their football heritage was even less back then. So, you know, this documentary is simply uh, just more of an attack against uh, particularly the previous uh, FIFA administration and of course uh, the intention is to undermine the legitimacy of this World Cup and of course the one in Russia as well. Two of the best tournaments ever held, uh, you know, I was at both of them. Uh, I covered the first one as a journalist. I'm here more in a, uh, uh, let's say, a pleasure capacity than uh, business. But the organization of this one has been unbelievable and uh, the fact that everything's so close to each other is a real model because all the stadiums are a max half an hour, an hour away from each other. People are going to two games in one day. People are able to go from their hotel to any stadium. Uh, you're not spending money getting a plane or a train to another place, or another hotel uh, for another city. So you can spend that money on tickets for matches. So it's been a really great experience, well organized. And uh, yeah, you know, they've finally got their turn. They'll have it in 2026. Let's see if the United States with its crumbling infrastructure is any uh, way, shape or form able to put a tournament on as well as this one and might I add as well, the one that was held in uh, 2018 in Russia as well. Yeah, and, and maybe the press crew will start asking questions about the American torture camp in Guantanamo, the American invasions and occupations of literally four dozen countries since the Second World War, or maybe not. Uh, it looks to me like a well-organized World Cup. And the absence of drunkenness seems to me to have been appreciated by those uh, foreign visitors who did go. Is that your take? 
Absolutely. I think people have seen those stories of uh, English ladies who have come here. There's one lady in particular whose quote has gone viral and she said that uh, I haven't been uh, catcalled once. I haven't been wolf whistled at once. I haven't been harassed uh, or sexually you know, abused or assaulted or anything like that. Not once has anything like that happened. She puts it down to both, of course, the lack of alcohol in and around the stadiums and generally, and of course as well, the culture, the conservative and traditional culture here in uh, Qatar. But of course it goes uh, uh, further than that as well. You know, again, you know, these uh, media organizations are very myopic in their view of the world. And many of them will come here. They'll stay in their hotels in the Pearl or in West Bay. Uh, they may not even, you know, these media figures and these media executives and lovey dubbies they may not even get a chance to mix with uh, local Qataris or local, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of Kerala's here. There are a lot of people from the Philippines. There are a lot of people from different countries here. How much interaction are these people actually having? Or are they just all, you know, tucked away in their little ghettos, far away from everyone else, refusing to integrate? We always hear about that term, don't we? They, they don't want to integrate. They're not learning the language. They're not trying to learn about the local culture. Uh, we need to uh, instill Qatari values in them and maybe, uh, you know, do it at the school level as well. Make sure the kids who are here all know about those as well. But of course, in a serious kind of level, it's, you know, the world's moving on and the Western world and the North American world needs to understand you're going to be left behind. And especially if you keep treating people who, uh, and nations who, to put it bluntly, have all the world's energy, you're going to treat them in such an arrogant way. You're already sanctioning yourselves with regards to Russia. You're going to be in for a really tough time. So maybe a little more humility, humble yourselves and uh, start to treat people as a, on an equal playing field rather than with this you know, neo-colonial attitude that stubbornly refuses to die. Well, the London mayor uh, refused to allow Qatar to advertise their World Cup that everybody in London is watching uh, because of uh, their perception of Qatar's views on, on the rainbow uh, issues. Uh, why should Qatar invest billions in London? when their money isn't even allowed to buy a billboard on the underground. Well, absolutely. Look, I mean, what, I mean, what does Qatar own? They own some of the most iconic parts of, you know, London skyline. They own Harrods. They, uh, they, they have a number of investments. And I don't know, I, I don't have that kind of insight, but maybe there are people here who are looking at it and thinking, hang on a second, we've bailed out your national airline. We bailed out British Airways. Next time we just won't. We'll leave you to it. Let's see how well you get on. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a classic example of shooting themselves in the foot, uh, the, the, the Westerners, that is, in particular the, uh, uh, in England as well, in, in the United Kingdom. Now, it's important here as well to note that that's not a reflective of the people of the United Kingdom. So firstly, you saw when the BBC refused to play the opening ceremony, all the outrage was from British people. They had enough of this virtue signalling nonsense. They wanted to watch the opening ceremony. And secondly, the English people that live here who are, you know, quote-unquote expats, English migrants who live here, all of them, all of them have come out swinging and saying this is not, the media campaign is not a reflection of Qatar. It's not a reflection of the place where we've made our home. This place is safe. It's clean. It's, you know, you can come here and make a good life for yourself. And that's also what the people who actually are coming to Qatar for the World Cup are saying as well. Actually, you know, um, I don't think many of them are pleasantly surprised because if they travelled here, they probably knew it was going to be fine. But they're saying it's great. All you people sitting at home talking about how terrible it is. You haven't actually been here. You probably never traveled to the Middle East, let alone to Qatar. So, you know, we also have to make sure that we understand that what the regimes in the West and maybe the media organizations in the West are saying and doing are not reflective of what the people of those countries are doing. And actually, I say regimes. Rishi Sunak came out, I think it was today, and said that this is one of the best organized World Cups. So even he's full of praise. For it. So I think these media organizations need to catch up with the uh, pulse of their own people and their own governments and of the people who are actually living and traveling to this part of the world. Now, finally, Isa, we've all got our views on who the best uh, team that we've seen so far is. But I want to ask you, as someone who is there, who are the best fans that you've seen moving around uh, Qatar in the last uh, couple of weeks? <laughs> Honestly, the, uh, the Saudis weren't bad when they were still in the tournament, but it's the Moroccans. Even in the group stages, they were unbelievable. And of course, now that 
uh, Morocco have got through to the last 16 and they're flying the flag for Africa, for the Arab world, for the Muslim world. Um, the Moroccans have been unbelievable. And, you know, go to Souk Waqif, which is like the old market kind of place in, a, in Doha. And it's just the Maghribis who are bringing the vibes, the Moroccans who are bringing the vibes. Uh, they're the ones who are making the, uh, you know, singing the songs and making it all go go along. And of course, you know, our African brothers and sisters from countries like uh, Cameroon and Senegal as well, even though, of course, they're not uh, winning now, they are losing, but their fans are doing a great job in the stands, trying to lift the spirits. And, uh, you know, uh, those guys have been really the ones who have caught my eyes. And the Japanese as well, they've been really popular here because, of course, they sent the Germans out. And uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, a lot of this going on whenever anyone sees German fans. So uh, the Japanese have been very popular as well. The Germans uh, should have done their talking on the pitch uh, rather than and that's what Arsene Wenger holding said. Yep. their hands. Arsene Wenger said it well. He's a wise man, Arsene Wenger. I can now concede now that he's <laughs> no longer the manager of Arsenal. Isa Ali, thank you for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let me get some calls in. Melvin is in New York and wants to talk about Twitter. Melvin, go ahead, brother. Hi, George. Do you hear me? Yes, very clear. Go ahead. All right. Nice to talk to you again. But on this one, I have to disagree with you uh, on this one part. Go ahead. Most of it I agree with you on, but this one part, I actually don't think anything is actually going to happen to anybody with any actual power. And the reason I have for that is if you look over the last 20 years of my country, how we've degraded our legal system, uh, I could pull up numerous points of how we've degraded our legal system. One I talked about before on your show, where we talked about how the police no longer have have to protect you, you know, where it used to be that they used to have the motto of serve and protect. A lot of things like that. But there's also one other aspect I'll throw in. About a year ago, um, right before our team uh, America was canceled, they had, uh, I think it was a few months beforehand, they had uh, some guys that were actually coming on that were ex-military or military that were whistleblowers about us actually supporting supporting terrorists and, and things like that through our government. That is a, is a call for treason. When you pay a terrorist to kill our own troops, that's treason to our people. And nothing has happened. There's been no investigation or anything. So honestly, I, I, I wish it was that there'd be investigations and that people would actually go to prison that have committed crimes. But when it comes to those powerful people in the United States, I just don't see it anymore. Well, of course, there's always the last straw that breaks the camel's back, uh, Melvin. I happen to think that uh, some of these statewide uh, government officials and some of these ex-Twitter executives will be arrested over this. That's my view. Thanks for the call. Mikio is in Germany and wants to talk about Germany. Mikio, welcome to the show. Hello, George. Uh, so honored to be able to talk to you. Now, please excuse my English. It's obviously not my first language. Anyways, um, you've been a great source of inspiration above all hope. And I assure you there are a lot of German people out there that feel the same. <laughs> I was, by the way... Uh, the one requesting you to apply for German citizenship that you respectfully declined, oh, and I don't okay. blame you at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, just, you suggested... You know, I'm, too old, I'm too old to change my spots. You can't, <laughs> okay. you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Go ahead. Right. You. Um, you suggested in your answer to my latest super chat that getting rid of Schultz is the way to go, and I couldn't agree more. But my question to you is, given the fact that we in Germany have basically four parties, who at least concerning international geopolitics stand as one, and we have a far left party below 5% who is being seemingly more busy coping with internal matters than anything else, and a far right party who is an outcast party basically that is for one infested by internal informants of the Verfassungsschutz and that will not take government given the fact that all other parties pledge not to coalesce with them. 
So what options do the German people actually have to change this devastating course? Well, I mean, uh, it's not for me to uh, dictate to German people about their politics, uh, and I'm not qualified to do it in any case. But uh, I would have supported, if I were living in Germany, I'd never be a German, but if I was living in Germany, I'd be in the Die Linke party, though I fully ex accept uh, that it too has a number of problems. But it has, uh, and did have, uh, until comparatively recently, a mass base, particularly in the east of the country, but also uh, in West Berlin and uh, in some other industrial areas that had a trade union base uh, that uh, could and should have been built upon. So I'd probably be with, uh, with Die Linke. Uh, I've got to tell you, there are lots of countries in the West uh, that don't have a uh, Die Linke and who are uh, obviously in an even worse situation. But the one thing that you cannot do, and we cannot do, is get into the game of picking the lesser of two evils of the established parties and backing them. First of all, because it is increasingly impossible to discern which of the two is the lesser evil in the Democrats and the Republicans, in Labour, in the Conservatives, in the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats in Germany, it is impossible to say that one is less evil than the other. And if I were to tell you my honest opinion, I'd have to say I think that Merkel is less evil than Schultz. I think that, uh, that uh, the Conservatives and the Republicans are less evil than the Labour Party and the uh, Democrats are, uh, only marginally, and both are evil, uh, but let's not get into that game, because if you back what you say is the lesser of two evils, evil still wins, and the, uh, the center of gravity moves further towards evilness if evil keeps winning. So I don't know what you can do, Mikio. I just know what you can't do, and I hope that you won't. Thanks uh, for that call and your kindness. Morpheus X says, don't worry, the five eyes will fight till the last Ukrainian and then the last European. They also intend to fight till the last Taiwanese, Chinese, Japanese, South Korean, Asians in ASEAN, and even the last Indian. It is indeed a remarkable thing. But they are experiencing setbacks, not just the military situation on the battlefield in Ukraine, as Scott Ritter so powerfully, peerlessly outlined for us earlier uh, in the show. Uh, but in Taiwan, for example, they just were comprehensively routed in the elections in Taiwan. The pro-US, pro-separatist party which wants Taiwan to declare its independence from China was routed and uh, the Taiwan people chose unity. Now it doesn't mean that the reunification of China is going to take place anytime soon but it does mean that the final rupture that would have led to war between Taiwan and China is now not going to happen. Sing Hallelujah. My good friend Liz Hill says, Dear George, best wishes as always from Malcolm Byrne and me in the US. We appreciate everything you do every week. Much love to you, to the gorgeous Gayatri and your beautiful children. Liz and Malcolm, I love you both very much. And Malcolm's uh, show is really something. He's a Pulitzer Prize winner, you know. And I've been on his show. How about that? Uh, Galloway Raider gives £89.99. Merry Christmas, George. Raider, that's the best Christmas present I've had yet. Thank you. Jordan Kaiser gives two US dollars. Your opening intro is the best. Thank you, Jordan. Mokovic gives one US dollar. Roger Asai gives 200 US dollars. Happy birthday, Randy. That's Randy Kerdico. I think you would have liked this guy with the same last name as our 
childhood neighbour. Randy, I'm sure you're watching. You always are. Uh, you'll know who Roger is talking about. God bless you, Roger. Thank you for that phenomenal donation. Apose Miosi gives five British pounds. Could you please talk about the rapid collapse of German industry and their attempts to keep the EU afloat by seizing Rosneft and Russian state assets? Yeah, we've dealt many times with the... It's not just forcing the Germans to commit economic self-harm. Factories are being unscrewed from the floor and taken away, in some cases to China, but in some cases to the United States. And even German workers are now being offered green cards to resettle in the United States where, hey, energy is cheaper. Can you believe the chutzpah of that? You blow up the Nord Stream pipeline and then tell German industry and industrial workers to come to America because energy is cheaper. Linda Petit gives £10. Thank you, Linda. Father Christmas X gives £5. Love the show. Uh, Daniela Modos Kutter gives £3.49. Conrad VFR 750 gives £5. Isn't the solution to Facebook and Twitter censorship to not use it? Well, <laughs> how am I going to talk to you then? Where are you going to find me then? Rudolf Grasspointer gives five euros. Eight million plus citizens fled Ukraine, 1990 to 2020. Why see demographics of Ukraine? Pat Daly gives 20 euros. Thank you, Pat. And Paco's Human says, thank you for a great perspective. Very good discussion. Amazing what the US media shows or doesn't about the games in Qatar. Let's go to line one to talk to Lima in Manchester. Need to be a quick call, Lima, but please, fire yeah. away. Okay, I'll try and make it quick. So I just want your honest opinion again regarding the political prisoner, Julian Assange, in the heart of our own city in London, Belmarsh Prison, and uh, the new situation with the Australian Prime Minister's uh, what he talked, what he mentioned, and Elon Musk uh, vote, you know. Um, so what's your opinion on this? What, what do you feel about it? And is there any hope for the, is there any hope for us? There is, because there is literally. hope. There is hope. There is hope. Where well, there's life, there's hope. Julian is hanging on in there. His good wife and children and father and mother and siblings are fighting hard for him. And some of the finest people on the earth are fighting for Julian Assange. People like Randy in, uh, in the United States, Malcolm Byrne, uh, on his show we've spoken uh, many times about the Julian Assange case. Roger Waters, probably the most eminent, certainly the most famous, but so many others. Some of the finest people on earth are fighting for Julian Assange because he's worth it. Now, I don't include the Prime Minister of Australia as amongst the finest people in the world, but belatedly, the Australian government is getting involved, and Australia is a part of the Five Eyes. Australia is an AUKUS ally of the United States. Australia could solve this matter. Australia could open the key to Belmarsh Jail and allow uh, Julian Assange to go free. And it has a duty and a responsibility to do so. Uh, the legal team of Assange are now moving the legal battle to the uh, European court, which still, of course, uh, Britain is a part of the European Court of Human Rights. It's nothing to do with the EU. We were in it before we joined the EU. We were amongst the people that set it up and we're still in it. And that uh, will delay, of course, the extradition of Julian, but not solve the problem of his ongoing incarceration in Belmarsh, which is killing him. I mean, literally killing him. We may, God forbid, we may wake up one morning to hear on the radio uh, that the world historic publisher and journalist and political prisoner Julian Assange 
has expired, has passed away in a British jail. It will be a mark of shame upon Britain forevermore. So I say to the Australian Prime Minister, to the British Prime Minister, I say even to the President of the United States, listen, if not to me and other champions of Julian, listen to the New York Times and the Guardian and Le Figaro and the other, uh, Der Spiegel and the other big newspapers in the world who've just asked you to drop these charges. Listen to them if you will not listen to better people like the great Roger Waters. Look, it's been marvelous for me and I hope it was for you, but that's all I've got time for. Don't forget my roadshow in Sunderland on Tuesday the 7th of February. You can still get tickets for that. And uh, don't forget that I'll be back here, God willing, on Wednesday for the midweek mother of all talk shows. Brought to you, sponsored by my good friend Ravi in Critical Cosmetics. And if you can sponsor the second hour of that show, get in touch, why don't you?